Well, good morning. And welcome to the worship of God. Our preparation for worship this morning is from A.W. Tozer. Jesus calls us to his rest, and meekness is his method. And the meek man cares not at all who is greater than he, because he's long ago decided that the esteem of the world is not worth the effort. And that's what Jesus is going to be talking about this morning when it comes to prayer. That there's a certain worldly way that we tend to think more in our culture about, well, okay, I'm going to try, people want to fit in with that. And Jesus is saying there's a danger on the other side of the, the, the road as well of trying to be seen as really religious. And that, that will mess you up too, and he doesn't want that for you. A call to worship is much different from that. It's shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. And know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us, and we are his. And we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And the praise team's going to come forward and help us, and we'll be worshiping God together in song. of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. He burns with holy fire, with splendor he is crowned. How awesome he Father, we do ask for your Spirit's help. We ask that for us as a gathered body, and also, Father, for us each, each individually, that our, our spirituality would be about the Holy Spirit. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen. It's this God who is with us who welcomes you with these words, and may grace be yours, and may God's mercy be yours, and may his peace rest on you. And these come from the God who is and who was and who is to come. And all of God's people said, Amen. and as God's welcomed us, let's welcome one another. We're going to continue worshiping our God together, singing How Great Thou Art. Oh Lord my God, when I am all 
awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, I hear the birds. mountain grandeur, and hear the brook, and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. But when I think that God is done not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art! When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and clear his tone, but joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim. My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! going to be singing together in a moment, one day when we all get to heaven. I ask the praise team can be seated too if you want. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 51. Psalm 51, in a moment we'll read together, one, one, sing together one day when we all get to heaven. I'm going to read from Psalm 51, which is one of David's psalms of confession. And this morning we're celebrating the, the Lord's Supper. And last week we were urged to examine our lives, not in the sense of, of perfection, but in the sense of is there any sin within us that were said, you know what, I'm, I'm fine with that sin. Well, David was fine with some sins, and this is where it wound up for him. You see that with him and Bathsheba. And in the end, he wasn't fine with sin at all. He said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out all my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight so that you're proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. 
Surely you desire truth in the inner parts, and you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. So thinking about that with the, the table that we'll be sharing today, if you're a sinner, that's, that's not anything that bars you from the table. But what David would, would say is, when I was in a place where I thought what I did with Bathsheba was, was fine, what I thought what I did with Uriah was just an acceptable way of getting rid of the trouble, he would say, I, I better not come to the table then. But for each of us, there is cleansing. And that's, that's what David's talking about here, and that's what Jesus did for us. Okay, we're going to be cleansed. And so whatever you've done, you go to the Lord, you confess it, and you say, I don't want to walk in those ways anymore. That he can cleanse. And he says, that's, that's what it is to come to the table. And that's also what it is to have assurance of the next life, and we'll be singing together one day when we all get to heaven. Will you please stand with us? And 
And in a moment we shall be changed. Yes, in a moment we shall be changed. In a moment we shall be changed on that day. When we going together to our, our God in prayer. We're going to be lifting up Diane Niemeyer. Diane had a minor surgery last week to get rid of an infection she's had for a number of months after uh, hip surgery, and now she's got, I found uh, another infection, so she's going to be at the Rock Valley Hospital for six weeks. So you think about yourself being in a hospital for six weeks, and what love would be is say, okay, I'm going to think about me being there. And now I'm going to think about Diane being there. So we'll be praying for Diane. Let's go together to our God in prayer. And our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask that our worship here, Father, would hallow your name. We ask that our celebration of the, the sacrament this morning, and Father, also for Elder and myself throughout the day with those who are unable to, to be with us right now, Father, that this would, would hallow your name. And we pray as well for the, the work that we support, that that would hallow your name, that that would honor you. We pray that for the work of the Runias in Cameroon and in Nigeria as we see in their, their support letter. And we pray that for the work of the Inwood Christian School and of the food pantry offerings this morning to that end. And we ask as well that you'd give us this day our daily bread. And that takes different forms. For Diane Niemeyer, it looks like patience and it looks like healing. For Gerald and James Ward and the, the family, it Looks like comfort in the passing of Jane's mom. For Eliza Neuendorp, it's regaining strength after her treatments. And for Angie Faber, it looks like strength for another year and rejoicing in another birthday. And we ask as well that you would forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And Father, we are not all that great at that. Not, not one person in this room, Father, I would dare say, would dare stand up and say, you know, when it comes to forgiveness, I am kind of an expert at that. Because we know we're not. But Father, you've tied our forgiving of others to your forgiveness of us. And if we come to see, Father, that we're just downright willing to to give what we've received, Father, we have to say, have I received it? And so, Father, we ask that we might all be forgivers, and Father, this morning's sacrament might be a, a taste of that, that we would taste and see that you're good, and Father, so want to be good. And that's hard for us. Father, perhaps there's relationships among us that are as frozen as some of the ice around us, and Father, we ask that you would bring a thaw. We ask that you'd lead us not into temptation, but that you'd deliver us from evil. This is uh, an evil age, Father, they all are. But we know the particular areas of ours. It's not just out there, it's, it's here, it's around us. And Father, in so many ways, it's, it's in us, Father. We ask that you'd deliver us. 
deliver us through what Jesus has taught us about murder and lust and breaking faith and lying and seeking vengeance and living loveless lies. And Father, deliver us through from what he's, he's telling us about hypocrisy as well. What a wretched man I am, says Paul, who will deliver me from this body of death. But thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ our Lord. And Father, we ask that we would see our need well enough to resonate with Paul's cry for help. And Father, that we would see your salvation well enough to resonate with his cry of thanksgiving. And Father, we ask that our celebration of the sacrament this morning would be all about that. Both a cry for help and a cry of thanksgiving. And Father, we don't know what, what lies ahead for us this next week, but we do know... Father, that yours will be the kingdom and yours will be the power and yours will be the, the glory forever. So we know how the, the story does end. And Father, we, we ask this. Father, because we want to see your kingdom come. And Father, we want to see your power and we want to see your glory. And Father, we ask that this would be the, the case as we, we think this morning in our religious acts. That these would not be about us, but they would be about you. That you'd be working in each of our hearts, that our hearts which are so very prone to twist not only what's bad, Father, but also very prone to twist what's good. That these would become more and more untwisted so your grace would flow through us and very winsome, beautiful ways. And Father, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thinking about the, the magnet that maybe you got on your fridge for the, the church with knowing God and seeking the Spirit and imitating Jesus, um, prayer is really where you see, see that incredibly closely because that, that's a relationship. So it's knowing God. So I ask that you turn with me in Bibles, because the way you know God is through the Bible. And Matthew 6, verses 5 to 8. Please turn with me to Matthew 6. We'll be looking at 5 through 8. If you'd please stand for the reading of God's Word. So as you hear these words, remember that we just prayed like one minute ago. And when you pray, do not pray like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go to your room, close the door, pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I encourage you to keep God's Word open, because what did we just do? Well, somebody just stood in front of you and prayed. Well, Jesus says, well, what, what about that? So am I, am I king hypocrite up here for, for doing that? Are we all hypocrites for praying together? Well, what's going on here? I would encourage you to keep God's Word open before you, because I want you to, to want to know what it means because that's how you know how to deal with God. Let's go to him in prayer. And Father, we ask that as we open your word together, we would learn something about prayer, that we would be listening as those who are wanting to be trained, that if we have anything other than a disciple's heart in us, Father, that you'd be, be working in us, so we might have the sense of saying, well, I pray, so help me know how to do it. And help me know how to not do it. That we might not be proud, but rather we'd be learners. And that we'd learn from the Master. We'd learn from Jesus and His words here. 
And we ask this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, When you do something, do it. When you do something, do it. If you want to tackle somebody in the four-yard line, you better mean to tackle that player on the four-yard line. When you do something, do it. You can't try at tackling somebody at that point. You can't kind of give it, give it your best shot. You do it. When you do something, do it. Are right, you going to play a musical instrument? Play it. All right, don't play at, at playing it. You play it. When you do something, do it. That's what Jesus thinks about with prayer. When you pray, pray. Now that seems obvious, but we all know there are situations in which we just play at it. We just play at sports. We just play at instruments. We just play at relationships. And Jesus would say, no, when you do something, do it. And that's the claim of the sermon about prayer. When you pray, pray. And Jesus, he's going to point out two ways in which we, we kind of play at it. And he's going to say, well, what are you doing? And the first way is hypocritical prayer. And that's our first point. Now, last week in the, the Sermon on the Mount, We've been working our way through it. Chapter 5, we're through that now. We're into 6. When you open 6, what you see is Jesus takes a turn because he's been showing you how dangerous unrighteousness is. He's been saying you need righteousness that exceeds the scribes, exceeds the Pharisees, because otherwise you're going to wind up in a crash through, through murderous thoughts, through lust, through breaking faith, through lying, through living loveless lives and through seeking to kind of get back at people. He's going to say, you're going to wind up in a big crash over here. And now he's saying, okay, well, if you want to take the wheel then and turn towards religious and being religious, because that way I'm never going to do those things, I'm really clean, well, you're going to wind up in crashes over here too. There's plenty, you're, you're always going to get in a crash on this side of the road. But there's plenty of crashes on this side of the road. We thought about David crashing on this side of the road with with Bathsheba, with Uriah. Jesus is saying, yeah, you don't want to go there. But there's also crashes over here. So there's crashes with with charitable giving. There's There's crashes with praying. And now we worry about the crashes on that side of the road. Right? Parents are rightly worried about their... their, with significant others and things like sexual purity... Rightly worried about kids when they're lying. Rightly worried about those things. But we don't tend to worry and say, well, well, where's where's Bobby? Well, Bobby's in his room praying. Oh, boy. We don't tend to think that. We, We don't tend to worry at all about this side of the road. But Jesus is saying this side of the road can be exceedingly dangerous. All right, some of us in this room might be overly responsible people, in which we tend to think that the whole world rests on us being good. Uh, Jesus is saying, you're in big trouble on that side of the road too. You could wind up in a crash there. Last week he taught about, talked about hypocritical giving. Now he's going to talk about hypocritical prayer. So now Jesus is all for prayer, just like he was all for giving. Jesus thinks that giving is great, but it can be really twisted. He thinks that prayer is great, but it can be twisted. But that doesn't mean he's going to say, you know what, since it can be twisted, don't pray. Just like Jesus would say, you know, just because church can become hypocritical, don't be involved with church. No, he he would never say that. He would just say, well, get it right here. And that's something that you can do no matter what. So he says, when you pray. 
Jesus assumes that you, as in you hearing me, will pray. You can't really be into football and not be into to running plays. You can't really be into your musical instrument and not into melody. You can't really be into a relationship with your significant other, but say, you know what, I'm not into talking with you. Honey, I love you. I, oh, nothing better than being with you, but I don't like to actually be with you. And Jesus is saying, okay, well, if you're into me, you're into talking to me. That's what's behind when you pray. Now, devout Jews and all of those listening to Jesus on that mountainside were, were Jews. They would pray three regular times a day. They'd pray morning, they'd pray noon, and they'd pray in the night. It's likely that the Apostle Paul kept this up his whole life. This is what he talks about when he says to the churches, ever since we've heard of you, we've never stopped praying. He's saying we pray in the morning for you, and we pray at noon for you, and we pray in the night for you. Now, there's nothing magic about this pattern, but it's worth you saying, okay, do you have some sort of pattern of regular prayer? Could you say, okay, I pray in the morning. Or I pray before I go to bed. To, to use the Puritans, is there, is there a time when you pray until you pray? And if you pray, you know what that means. Do you pray until you actually pray? Because it takes a while to actually be talking to God. We're all being formed by a culture, and the culture in which you live is exceedingly prayerless. Right, if, you, if you don't believe me, when's the last time you were watching a TV show or a movie in which somebody was actually praying? You don't see it at all. We live in an exceedingly prayerless culture. Even the thought that somebody would put that even on TV in some sort of show is just bizarre. I mean, if anybody, is, if, if anybody prays in our culture, they are seen as A-plus spirituality. And Jesus says, well, okay, if you're part of my kingdom, that's just kind of part of being in my kingdom. And so what that says to me is, how much am I actually being formed by by?" this culture in which we live in America and how much am I being formed by Jesus' culture? Because you're being formed. I'm being formed. It's just by who? We're all disciples. It's just whose disciples are we? And so Jesus, throughout his whole life, because he lives in a praying culture, saw people praying, heard people praying, and a lot of it, even though it was very religious, left him frustrated. Now, sin frustrates God, whether it's packaged as unrighteousness, so murder, lust, breaking faith, lovelessness, revenge, or whether it's packaged as righteousness. And God can tell. All right, he, he can tell whether you've just wrapped sin up as righteousness or whether you've wrapped sin up as unrighteousness. He knows what's in the box. And when you pray, says Jesus, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. So now what this is about, it's about other person-directed prayer. This is, this is about not praying to God, but praying for the sake of somebody who's there. 
This is a sense of saying, okay, you've got a father who's frustrated with his son, and they're at the dinner table, and he's frustrated because his son's been complaining about every single thing that his wife's been making for supper. And so he's going to teach his son about, about generosity, and so they pray, Father, thank you for how generous you are. And Father, we thank you for this meal before us, and Father, we ask that if we're not, Father, thankful for what, what Mom makes, and if we're prone to say disparaging things about what Mom makes and roll our eyes, Father, that you change us. And we ask that you bless this food out of our bodies and our bodies to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. I've, I've prayed prayers like that. You've prayed prayers like that, probably. It's not to God. It's just a way of, I kind of want to tell you something, but I don't want you to be able to talk back to me. And so I'm going to put God between us. It's not talking to God at all. It's prayers Jesus is aiming at here that are improved at enhancing your reputation with other people. It's prayers that you never pray in, in private, but you're happy to request for either prayers or to pray for these things in public with others because that way others will know you're about that cause. I mean, I'm not about this cause enough to pray for it myself when nobody hears, but I really do want others to know I'm about this cause. It's prayer that's aimed at other people thinking, she's, she's pretty spiritual. Rather than aimed at God, who he already knows your heart. Now, as it is with, with last week with giving, Jesus isn't limiting this to just prayer. Right? We don't want to read the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, and say, I better get giving right, prayer right, and fasting right, and then I'm okay. No, he's saying, okay, any sort of religious, spiritual thing, where's your heart at? Because we can have it be about other people. We can have it be about Facebook posts. Just spent 45 minutes with Jesus. Spiritual sweat. Hashtag blessed. All right, we, we can have it be about making sure that that girl in the group that you're with knows that you went on that mission trip. Because you want her to see you as the kind of guy that goes on, on mission trips. It can be about other people. It's spirituality. We can easily be about anything other than the Holy Spirit. It's really easy to fall into, which is why Jesus keeps pointing it out now to say, don't crash over there. So if you think I'm somehow having a go at you or having a go at religious people, like us, all I'm doing is saying Jesus is warning us. And so if you're kind of frustrated by whatever's churning up in your heart, take this as a sign of saying Jesus might be warning you about something. Because we tend to do things for our own image. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. Now Jesus, he's not saying this because he's got anything against praying in public. I mean, read John 17. That's all Jesus praying in public. Read through the Gospels. You'll see Jesus regularly do what we did. Pray in public. He's also got nothing we're going to see against repetitive or long prayers. He prayed many long prayers. He often prayed the same thing again and again. What he's against is saying, okay, who's your audience? And we need to inspect ourselves for hypocrisy here. There's no other way to hear the words of Jesus and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. All right, if, if I'm not willing to inspect myself for hypocrisy here, then I'm just not hearing Jesus. 
As hypocrisy is always ambitious, we need not wonder it's also blind. That's, that's, how, that's what Kelvin said. He's spot on. He's saying, okay, it's ambitious in the sense of I want people to think of me a certain way. I need people to think of me as good. So I'm going to do these things so I'm thought of as good. And what Kelvin's saying is that's hypocrisy. And that's why you're blind to it. And we can all fall into this. All right, Jesus isn't talking about just fight. He's not talking about, like, say, just Hitler and Mao here. He's saying, Adam, you listen up here. You don't want to do your spirituality for others. And now, assuming, here's the assumption that you need to have the new heart's assumption is always there is a lot of filth in here, there is a lot wrong in here. The new heart thinks there's a large swath of territory within it that needs to be changed. All right, the heart that's not new says, I don't want this or this, so lay off. No, the new heart says, I need change. Well, what's, what's the gate in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who know they're messed up but are willing to make whatever changes God says to make. That's those who are happy. So you, you don't want to do your spirituality for others. If you do, you've already received your reward. That's what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. They've re- you've received your reward. You want people to think of you as good, and so you do good things? Well, people think of you as good. Last week we thought about that that's pretty meaningless actually. Now we're going to see how very fragile it is. Because if what you really want is for other people to think you're good because you're a good prayer, well, what if they think something different because you smoke? What if they think something different because maybe you're a too little into sports for them? What if they think something different because they might consider you a workaholic? We are all exceedingly petty, judgmental people. That is everyone. We are all that way. If we find out something about somebody that we disagree with, no matter how often slight it is, I'm kind of here. They're kind of there. Do you want to put your sense of well-being in the hands of people like that? Meaning people like me. Meaning people like you. Jesus is saying, is that the reward you want? You're going to do all this so people think that you're a good prayer, but when they actually knew you, they'd find something to, to throw you under the bus with? That's who you're going to trust? That's, who, that, yeah, that's what you want? Them to think you're good? Well, okay, that's your reward then. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, don't, don't live for that. So Jesus, he's warning us against that. And his pattern is to warn us against how dangerous that is. And then to say, okay, let me show you the right way forward. That's the right way forward, verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. So this, but as for you, is emphatic. This is like a mom dropping her kid off at school saying, other kids are going to bully people. Other kids are going to leave kids out when they're playing. As for you, you care. You share. That's what Jesus is saying. Yeah, other people will do that. As for you, you pray to your Father. And now Jesus, He's talking here about praying to the Father. He's not saying that going into the inner room, which is usually the only room in the houses in those days that would have any sort of lock and key on it. He's not saying that's the only place to pray because He's about to teach them a prayer. And he regularly prays with them in public. And he regularly teaches them how to pray in public. He's saying, who are you talking to when you pray? Because what he's after is saying, if you're really after other people seeing you pray or hearing you pray, 
you're not going to pray in public. Or like, say, like a musical instrument. All right, if, if you're not actually ever going to practice until a day before you, you meet with your teacher, you're not really into it. That's what Jesus is saying. Unless, you, I mean, the praying in private isn't the only place to do it. It's just saying you're not going to pray in private if it's really about other people anyway. Now Jesus, he, he knows full well because we can do this. We're so twisted. We can make private prayer about even our image of ourself. <laughs> Spent 15 minutes in prayer this morning by myself. Oh, did, did anybody else do that? That's what we tend to do. You know, I'm really regular in my devotions. If other people were really regular in their devotions, meaning if other people were like me, whew, this would be a better place. That, that Jesus, He's warning us against that because who's the audience there? It's not God. It's just me thinking I'm a good guy. So now those who pray for others, they've got their reward. But those who pray to the Father, they receive what He can give. When you pray, don't be like the show-offs, as Bruner puts it. Pray to your Father who's in secret and your Father who's watching in secret, oh, He will reward you. So now the Father takes great delight in prayer that's actually to Him. Think about it in terms of a mom. Her mom this mom packs her, her kids' lunches and they, they go to school and packs her own lunch and she goes to work. And when she gets to lunchtime, she opens her lunch and there's a little note from her eight-year-old daughter in there and it's got bunnies drawn on it, it's got hearts drawn on it, it's got birds drawn on it, and it's got have a good day written on it. Do you think that mom will reward that? You better believe your mom, that mom will reward that. Because it was given in secret. Because nobody else knew because it was aimed at nothing other than delighting her mom's heart. That's how you know it's genuine. It's other-focused. And that's what Jesus is saying about prayer. Are you really talking to your Father? If so, He'll reward you. If you're talking to somebody else, you'll get what they can do for you. So selfless love, that's the opposite of hypocrisy. And now expecting to be heard, we see, is the opposite of babbling prayer. And that's our second point, babbling prayer. Jesus' point here, it's not primarily about length. It's about expectations. He's saying, okay, what do you expect when you talk with God? And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Now, people have all sorts of expectations about God. We have all sorts of expectations about each other. The way we see our expectations about each other usually comes out in words. Our expectations about God come out in words. And what Jesus is saying here is, listen to all the religions around us did you notice how they pray for a long, long, long time? The reason is they think that's what's necessary to get what they want. So Baal needs to be badgered. Molech, he needs to be mollified. The idea is the gods are fickle. The gods really don't care about you. They don't know what's going on, so you got to tell them and you got to stay on top of them. The idea is they actually don't want to do the job, so you need to keep calling them every day. You got to drop the hammer on them if you want them to do anything. You got to ride them. That's the idea. And this this burns, turns prayer into some form of, of magic. They need a push. And the harder you push, the more likely they are to do it. So the harder you pray, oh, we really prayed. So God just needs to be pushed because He doesn't seem to really care. 
That, that's what Jesus is having a go at here. Now Jesus, he thinks of it differently. He's not against praying for a long time, but he'd likely agree with Augustine to say, remove from prayer much speaking, but not much praying. Now Jesus, he prayed at length, but it's not because he thought his dad was a cosmic cheapskate that really didn't want to do anything good for any of his children, but really needed a big kick to do it. Kick to get off the cosmic couch. That we've got a big honeydew list that we bring to God, and he's like, yeah, yeah, fine, i got nothing going today anyway, so I'll do it. That's what Jesus is against, that view of God. I must get rid of this thought that God is standing between me and my desires, and that which is best for me, as Lloyd-Jones put it. Hear that again, because it might be in your heart. I need to get rid of this thought that God is standing between me and my desires, and that which is best for me. That's a hard notion to get rid of. I mean, if you don't have that notion in you somewhere, that God's standing between you and what would be good for you and what you really want, I would be utterly fascinated to hear how it is that you've done that. I don't think any of us has that. That real gut instinct that God is always for me and everything is wonderful because He's in charge. That's something we struggle mightily with. Jesus knows that, so He's trying to train us out of it. That's why he says your father already knows what you need before you ask him. So don't go to him as if you got secure concessions from him. So then the question comes up and quick people and you're quick people. Well, then why do we pray at all? Well, it's, it's about relationship. Bruner's spot on here. He says in personal relationships, it's precisely with those human beings who know us best who sometimes know our needs better than we do, with whom we speak the most freely. And so it is with God. That is how it goes. The people I open up to the most are the people who already know. They already get it. They know me. They often know me better than I know me. That's why I talk to them. Because they know. That's how it is with God. Talk to Him. Because He knows. He knows the situation you're in. He put you in that situation. That is true. The situation you're in right now, God put you in it. So you can talk to Him about it whenever you want. Because He knows it. And He knows you. That's what Jesus is saying. You're not going to tell him anything he doesn't know, so talk to him about it. Because the alternative goes really badly for you. That's where all these things in us come out in weird ways. Jesus, he's trying to get to it, avoid that. You go to your Father. So the question is, do we believe that? The question that Christians need to usually wrestle with is, do I think I know God better than Jesus knows Him? And the answer tends to be, yes, we think we do. I think I've got a better read on God than Jesus. But okay, do we? Jesus thinks that your Father knows and He cares. Is that how you think of God? And Jesus says, if so, prayer is going to be natural. That's what's behind his assumption that you'll pray. That's what's behind his instruction to say when you pray, pray. He's after religion that's about God, not about us. Because what's best for us is not that which is about us. What's best for you is God. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we tend to, to miss the, the point each of us do about it being about you. Help us. 
We ask this in regards to prayer. We ask it in regards to giving. We ask it in regards to all forms of spirituality. We very easily make spirituality about anything other than the Holy Spirit. Help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing together now in response, Hymn of Heaven. For, for the Lord's Supper, um, what we do the week before is we talk about preparing our, our hearts and then we talk about not eating and drinking unworthily because we bring judgment. Paul says that. He just gets this from Jesus and what Paul would say for you about this meal this morning would say, okay, if the main goal 
of your spiritual life is to say, okay, I don't, I don't do those things. I don't do, oh, man, I'm past the lust. I'm past the murder. I'm past the, well, he's going to say, you better not take this this morning. Because he's saying, you're, you're just crashing over here. And if the whole goal of your life is saying, okay, well, you know, I'm not one of those religious hypocrites. I'm not one of those people, but no, I'm going to live authentically and whatever I feel like I'm going to do. No, no, Jesus is saying, this, this, you better get right with me before you take this. And what profession of faith is, is it's just saying it's a profession of faith. I, I'm right with God because of Jesus, and I need to live into him and his way of, of life, trusting the Father. And what trust looks like on the inside is trust. What it looks like on the outside is, is obedience. And so if there's anything in us that God is saying, okay, I want you to change this, well, then we, we change it. And that's what, what this meal is about. And the profession of faith is the public marker of that. So if you profess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're, you're more than welcome at this, at this table. And if there's any sin lingering within you that you wish was dead, don't let that keep you from this. This then is strength. But you, you don't want to fall into presumption either. So we're going to be doing the bread. And when the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed... He took bread because they're, they're eating bread. It's not special bread, it's, it's bread. They're eating it and he breaks it. He says, this is my body, which is broken for you. You do this in remembrance of me.
And we remember and we believe that the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. And after supper, the, the Lord took the cup. And he said, this is the, the cup of the, the new covenant, which is given in my blood. And we think about that in terms of forgiveness. Um, yeah, nobody is worthy to come to the table. That's not what it's about. But there is a sense of saying, there's a strange worthiness and unworthiness. of Saying, God, please change me. And God, please forgive me. This blood of the cross, this is saying, okay, this is what forgives you.
So you take and you drink. Remember and believe that the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my sins and he heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit. He crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things. Let's go to our God in prayer, thinking about the, the offerings. And Father, as you've given to us, Father, in this sacrament and of your Son, and in more ways than we can count, we give you a portion of your own in our offerings for the work of this congregation. And Father, for this week's special cause for Inwood Christian School, and as well as the, the offerings of food that we've brought. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name that you'd bless this giving. Amen. And if you'd please stand for the parting blessing. And after you receive the parting blessing, we'll sing together benediction. And may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may he be very, very gracious unto you. And may the Lord smile on you. And may he give you his peace. Amen. Praise for his glory. 